So you've got your own 3D printer, but you're yet to design and print your own parts. Well, here are five essential tips to help you do just that. If you've just got your first 3D printer, there's a good chance you've set it up, probably done the test prints on the SD card, and maybe ventured onto Thingiverse or My Mini Factory to find some pre-made files to print. You might be thinking that you'd like to have a go at designing and printing your own items, but you just don't know where to start. Well, this video is going to present five essential tips to get you going so you can design the right type of parts for successful 3D printing. We're going to use Tinkercad because it's free, easy to use, and doesn't need any installation. We're also gonna look at some real world practical examples, demonstrating with blocks, as well as some test prints. So let's get started with a very short lesson on Tinkercad, and then after that, jump straight into the tips. Tinkercad is very user-friendly for beginners. We have all of our shapes on the side, and to use any of them, we simply drag them to the middle of the screen. We can then click and drag the object to move it around, or use this black arrow to move things up and down. If we drag from the white dots in the corner, we can resize, and the one in the center will resize vertically. You'll also notice there's these floating arrows here, and we can use that to rotate the parts. Camera control is essential. Sometimes you won't see the right set of arrows until you look from the right direction. We can drag out as many shapes as we want and build them up and get them to overlap before finally selecting both and coming up to the group button to merge them into one. We can also do something very similar if we want to make some holes. We can drag out any shape and then instead of a color, we can set it to hole, resize it, move it into position, and then once again, select everything and click group. As you can see, the shape that was set to be a hole has eaten out of the other shape and given us our desired geometry. Beyond the many shapes found in the basic shape section, you can also access the drop down and look at all the other ones on offer. If you come to shape generators and then click all, you'll have many, many options, most of which are customizable. For instance, this gear. We drag it out to the middle and then we'll be presented with a dialog box where we can set the parameters for our gear. That way when we 3D print it, we know everything's gonna mesh perfectly and it's gonna function as we would expect. On top of these easy to use tools, we'll find features that you would find in many other programs, such as copy and paste with Control C and then Control V to make a copy. We can also do similar things with these buttons up the top as well as deleting shapes. When we're finished designing, we simply come up to export and click the SDL button, our file will download and be ready for 3D printing. Now that we've got some understanding of the software, let's get into our tips. Tip number one is to design parts with a flat base. This one seems pretty obvious, but you'd be amazed how many times people get it wrong. Let's consider a pyramid. If we try to build it upside down, we have a single block touching the ground and then four above that and then much larger above that. And it doesn't take much sense to know that that's not gonna work. If we start the other way around with a wide stable base and then build up towards the point, it's very easy. Quite often my students will present something like this to me as ready to print because this is the way the diamond faces when you drag it out from Tinkercad. It won't be long into your 3D printing journey that you discover how important first layer adhesion is. And after a few layers, this one gets knocked loose and starts printing spaghetti. A lot of the time, the solution is as easy as flipping the part around to reorient it. Quite often, without modifying the geometry, we can achieve a much more stable and reliable print by doing this. If you don't have this option, you can always try adding a raft in the slicing software, which will enlarge the footprint and increase your chances of success. What about if we've got a really round shape and it's not possible to spin it around in any particular direction to get a flat bottom like these four spheres here? Well, here's a little tip for you. You can drag out a box and you can make it really oversized and really big, basically bigger than the object. We're then going to move it down and spin the camera so we can see exactly where it is. I'm gonna bring it up so it just overlaps my shape. Now I can drag a box around everything, group, and this box will cut a chunk off the bottom of my other shape and give it a relatively flat base so now it has a chance of printing successfully. Tip number two is to avoid steep overhangs. The job of the slicer in 3D printing is to slice the object vertically because it's built from the ground up layer by layer. 
What does this mean for us as we're designing in Tinkercad? Well, to demonstrate, I've designed this very simple part that shows what will and won't work. This geometry has three features, an angled overhang, a bridged overhang in the center, and then a cantilevered overhang on the right, which isn't supported at all. In the early phases of the print, we can see that the angled overhang is in effect. We'll note that if we build with the blocks, we can have slight overhangs, but if they get too steep, it collapses. The same works with 3D printing. You can see on the left here, this 45 degree overhang is printed without any trouble at all. The same effect is found on this overhang test, which changes 10 degrees every few millimeters. You can see at the base, everything's quite smooth, but it reaches a certain amount of overhang, and from there, everything starts to droop. Things get interesting when we get to the other two overhangs. We can see as it gets to this area, it will in fact be printing in mid-air. The results for the bridge overhang and the cantilever overhang couldn't be more different. As you can see, the bridge has something supported on both sides and it can safely make it across. The cantilevered overhang, however, is hanging down vertically because it's only supported on one side. With the blocks, it's really easy to demonstrate a stable bridge. For the cantilevered overhang, it seems obvious that it's never really going to work, although as more and more layers are added, it does a surprisingly good job of recovering and forming the geometry we were after. Quite often we start our students with designing key rings and they come up with something like this. The arms represent a massive problem because as we get to them, there's absolutely nothing holding them up and therefore they're going to be in mid-air. When we demonstrate on the blocks, it seems pretty obvious what's going to happen. The way around this, of course, is to add support material, but this will add more time and use more plastic. So if you can design your part to avoid overhangs, it'll be much better. Tip number three, the direction of your layer lines dictates the strength of the final part. Here's a simple rectangular prism, one standing up, the other flat down on its side to demonstrate this principle. They both print without any issues, the difference is going to be in the final part. On this close up, we can see exactly where the layer lines are and they're going from left to right in each instance. For the version on the left, the layer lines are going across the narrowest part of the shape and are going across the longest part of the shape on the right. Let's put our samples in a vise and whack them with a hammer. We can see the one where the layer lines are going long ways, it's pretty strong, but when we switch around to the other one, it breaks almost immediately. Back to that first one, I hit it harder and harder until eventually it fails but that's not from the extrusion snapping, but rather the layers coming apart. And that's because our extruded plastic is very strong, but the weakness is the layer lines coming apart. Where possible, orient your parts to avoid this weakness. Tip four is to pay close attention to your dimensions as you're designing. In Tinkercad, you can easily find out the dimensions of a part, whether it's a single shape like on the left or a compound shape made up of grouped parts. If we click on our shape and then click in one of the white corner boxes, it'll tell us the dimensions for X and Y. And if we click on the fifth box that's located in the center, it'll also tell us the height. From there, if you need to, you can make adjustments by either dragging the shape or clicking on the dimension and typing in what you want. Another thing that really catches people out is having features that are too small. In your slicing software, a typical width of a single extrusion is around half a millimeter. Although we can see the text in the STL, as soon as we press slice, we can see some of the text is narrower than that target extrusion and therefore it is ignored by the slicer. Tip five is to be patient and iterate your design. I recently designed this touch me mount for the Sidewinder X1 and it had to be very precise in aligning two magnets and that meant it took about a dozen goes to get it right. You see here, I have a shape made up of many subshapes. And you might think if you want to edit their positions, you need to click and then ungroup. But a shortcut is to simply double click. That'll take you inside your grouping where you can make adjustments. For instance, setting the snapping to a much smaller increment and then using the keyboard to nudge something into place. When you're done, simply double click elsewhere on the grid and your group will reapply and update. If you're designing something tricky that needs to fit a real world object, like this clamp I made to go on the front of a go-kart to enable me to wheel it around in car parks easily, well, here's a great tip for you. Select your object and then shrink or cut it down to be quite thin. It'll now be much quicker to print and you can do a test fit before you commit to the full thing. 
If you've been on the cusp of trying this, hopefully these tips can help get you over the line in having a go. Trust me, there's not much more satisfying than identifying a problem in real life, heading to your computer, drawing something up, printing it, and coming up with a perfect solution. If I've missed any tips, please post them in the comments below so your fellow viewers can benefit from them. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.